Hello everybody, I am Ben from Team Panic and today we're going to do a quick uh, refresh and update to a video I did a very, very long time ago. That is how you read RC signals into an Arduino or any type of microcontroller. Now, uh, back when I did that video, I made a few mistakes here and there in uh, what I was talking about. So I thought it was time to update and refresh and redo that whole thing. All right, well, I think that's enough of that. Let's uh, jump right on in to what RC signals are and how you get them into a microcontroller. So there are two different types of receivers that I want to talk about today. There are these standard type here, which have a channel out and a power and a ground for every single pin that they can access. So this is a four channel receiver. It has four signal pins, four power pins and four ground pins. And that's a fairly standard thing for a receiver. Now for something like this, you need to run at least ground, uh, at least one ground between it and your microcontroller. And then you also need to run one wire for each channel you want to talk to. So this one here, I've got set up to run two channels into this microcontroller at the back. But if I wanted three and four channels, I would need to run even more wires into this thing. And you start losing pins on a microcontroller very quickly. This type of setup is totally fine for very easy little things like a couple of channels, like what I'm doing here. Uh, but if you need more channels, then you want to start looking at something like this. So this here is an SBUS receiver for Flysky. It uh, uses a very, very complicated communications protocol that we won't get into today. Uh, and it sends all of the information for up to 16 channels, I believe this one is, down the one signal wire. Uh, we will talk about this a little bit, but I'm not really going to break down its full communications protocol because that is a, a whole video in its own right. So, but we will talk very briefly about how you actually uh, program for these. Anyway, let's go back to these guys and talk about RC slash servo signals. Now, uh, I'm saying slash because they can be called an RC signal, they can be called a servo signal. They're originally used for servos, uh, but now, yeah, they're used pretty much everywhere inside uh, RC gear. Now, they are, unlike what I said in the last video, not a PPM signal. They are a modified PWM signal. Now, for those of you who missed the last couple of videos because they are quite, quite old, PWM is a pulse width modulation signal, which means that as the signal comes down the line, the pulse, which is these things, which is what carries your data, the width of that is changed or modulated to give you the data. So in our case with a servo signal, we have one pulse that happens inside 20 milliseconds. It's There's a bit of variance in this. It can be kind of 16 to 24 milliseconds, but somewhere inside 16 to 24 milliseconds, you'll have a single pulse. And that single pulse will be somewhere between one millisecond when the channel is all the way down and two milliseconds when the channel is all the way up at the other end. Now, this goes even for those things that are spring loaded. So this guy right now sitting in the middle is sending a 1.5 millisecond pulse. At the low end, it sends a one millisecond pulse, and at the high end, it sends a two millisecond pulse. So if your aim is to do drive mixing, for example, with an Arduino, you need to make sure that your red values zero your motors out when you're getting a 1.5 millisecond pulse rather than a one millisecond pulse, because one millisecond pulse should be full reverse if you're trying to use this for a drive type system. Now, this is just, as I said, one variation of PWM. Uh, PWM is used for a lot of other things as well. It's actually used to control how much voltage or effective voltage is going to a motor, uh, but that again is a whole other video. And in actual fact, I've done that video. There is a video on this channel titled PWM versus PPM. And I will leave a link to that down below. And that goes more in depth into how PWM is used to control how fast motors move. So this is our current setup. We need to work out how to read these individual pulses as they come down the line from our individual channels. Now you will get one set of pulses each 16 to 24 milliseconds 
from each channel. So the more channels you have plugged in, the more channels you have to read and the more pulses you're going to get coming into your microcontroller. There is a couple of ways to do this uh, and they range from no, 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 don't do this if you actually want the thing to work uh, all the way up to this is awesome and you should do it this way. So let's go through those. Basically, uh, Arduino itself has a function in it which is called pulse in. What pulse in does is it literally, when you call pulse in, it reads the channel. If the channel is high, it waits for it to go low. If the channel is low, it waits for it to go high and then low. Uh, so that's totally fine if you call pulse in here. So if you call pulse in here, that's fine because pulse in will start up, it will see the channel go high, Two milliseconds later, it will see the channel go low. It will say, okay, that's a two millisecond pulse. Awesome, done and dusted. But if you get unlucky and you call pulse in here, for example, it's gonna be 15 milliseconds or so before the thing actually pulls high. And this time it's gonna read you one millisecond pulse. By the way, this is not normally how you would see this. You normally wouldn't see a straight from full to nothing unless you've got like a switch going on on your radio uh, but as a point of example so you've got a 15 millisecond gap where pulse in from Arduino is sitting there doing nothing it's literally sitting there going checking yep still zero still zero still zero still zero just busy waiting essentially chocking like yeah jamming up all your processing time doing absolutely nothing waiting for this pulse to come through. The pulse comes through, it goes, oh cool, that's one millisecond, and then it moves on. The problem with this is that in the time between this pulse and this pulse, you'll actually have, if you've got a different channel, so let's say this is our channel two down here, and you can't really see that, but that's cool. Uh, so yeah, five volts and stuff. So this is our channel two. Channel two is gonna pulse about here each time. Right, it's gonna pulse pretty quickly after channel one. So if we try and read channel one here, we're gonna miss this whole pulse because pulse in is still waiting for channel one to do something and then bam, channel one does something. That's cool, now we'll read this pulse out of channel two. So we miss whatever this pulse happened here in channel one, uh, in channel two. So pulse in is, look, it's a way to do it and you can technically do it but it's a really bad idea. Um, so don't do that because yes, pulse in gets yeah, complicated, messy, and can cause your system to lag behind your inputs, which is never what you want, especially in a combat robot type scenario. So the next idea is to do this yourself. Rather than pulse in, what you can do is you can periodically check the line yourself. So you go through and you ask Arduino, is the line high or is the line low? And what was the state beforehand? So the last time I checked it, was the line low? If the line was low and the line is now high, you have seen this rising edge, which means you need to start a timer and you need to then keep going through your loop, constantly through your loop. And then once it goes from high back to low, so once you read a low and the last iteration was high, then you've seen the other edge and you calculate your time out from there. So you'll save a timestamp, save another timestamp, and then you can work out what your distance is there. This, uh, you can do it, it's effectively known as a tight loop, because what it means is you've got a little section at the top of your code, which does the check, and then you've done, you have another section down here, which does what you want to do with that. So in our case, that could be, do your mixing and set your motors. So you do your mixing, you set your motors, and then you loop back around to the top. But the thing with this is, it's called a tight loop because you want this to be really, really, really quick. The faster you can make this loop, the better your checking is gonna be and your fidelity is gonna be. The thing with this is tight loops aren't, you don't usually see them too often in microcontroller stuff because a lot of people come from an old school where microcontrollers were slow and the things that they were trying to do were fairly fast. So tight loops, you couldn't put a lot inside your tight loop before you started 
completely blowing out past your signal. Whereas these days, an Arduino will run at 16 megahertz, which means one clock pulse every 62 nanoseconds, which is 0.062 microseconds. Oh, sorry, yes, microseconds. So, uh, which is 0 0.000062 milliseconds. Uh, so that's how long an instruction or a fourth of an instruction takes, depending on the architecture you're using. That's, this is getting really into the weeds. I'm sorry, but I, I, I like this stuff. So I'm gonna kind of quickly get into some weeds and then we'll go back. But, so this is how long it takes for an instruction or a fourth of an instruction. I can't remember, like I said, it depends on the architecture you're using for an instruction to activate. So you can see with two milliseconds worth of time, we have a lot of these architectures we can burn, or we have a lot of uh, clock cycles we can burn before we really need to get back to do this check again. So this kind of tight loop control, especially when you have fast running microcontrollers, it works. It does its job fairly well. Uh, and it also then doesn't use interrupts and things, which in some cases you can't do. So this guy over here, which is running a chip that doesn't have an Arduino on it, it's interrupt systems are weird and don't quite work the way they need to for this type of system. So I've had to use this type of tight loop control to actually read the Arduino signal and then output, uh, sorry, the RC signal and then output the motor controlling. And it works fine. It's not, not the done thing still, even though it's totally possible with these fast microcontrollers, it's still not quite the done thing to do. Anyway, that gets us over to the done thing to do, which uh, I've kind of already hinted at a little bit, it's called interrupting. So what you do is you tell the microcontroller that this channel, that uh, this pin that this channel is running into, whenever there's a change in the line, we want to know about it. We want you to stop whatever it is you're doing and jump straight over to this new section of code that we've written. And so that kind of looks a little bit like this. What you'll end up with is, this is your mix code and your set motors. And that just loops within itself. And then you also have this other bit over here, which fires every time you have an interrupt and that's your read RX stuff. So every time there's a change in any of this, this stuff fires. And basically what it does is it goes, okay, are we rising edge? Have we just gone from low to high or have we just gone from high to low? If we've gone from low to high, we wanna again, save our timestamp. And if we've just gone from high to low, then we wanna save another timestamp and work out the difference between these two and then update a value that this code over here is gonna to use to do the mixing and the setting of the motors. This is cool and this is fine. Uh, because it's an interrupt to your main code, you want this to be as quick as possible because you're basically stopping whatever you're doing here, jumping out, doing the new thing, and then jumping back, and then keeping on going with the mixing and the setting of the motors. So you want this to be very, very quick. It's also the reason why this type of SBUS controller is really interesting because this guy with interrupt stuff, if you want to do 16 channels, you need 16 pins available and you need 16 interrupts, which means that you're going to be spending a hell of a lot of time in your interrupt section where you're jumping out, doing your interrupt, jumping back, jumping out, doing your interrupt, jumping back. Like there's not going to be a lot of time left inside your main loop to do your main mixing and your setting of your motors and all that kind of stuff. So this interrupt setup works really well for kind of one to four pins, I would say. And even that's probably pushing it. I do one to two pins realistically and then kind of leave the third as a maybe and then I've never really had to a time to put a fourth onto any of this type of stuff. So yeah, there you go. That is how you read a traditional RC signal. I'll leave some um, GitHub links and stuff into the comments down below, which are just examples of other people's GitHubs that I've found that do something similar to this, uh, especially the interrupt code, because that's probably the best one here. Uh, there's a YouTuber called James Bruton who has done a, an amazing like bunch of stuff with uh, robotics. And yeah, he has an interrupt set up 
code, which is quite simple, quite straightforward, quite easy to understand. So I will leave that uh, in the description down below. Finally, we're gonna get over to these guys, the little SBUS receivers. Now, as I said before, these SBUS receivers are a complicated thing. They use a whole com serial communications protocol uh, running down this line to give you up to you know 16 or more channels off of one data pin. So this type of thing, it is best uh, to not code yourself. Basically, there are some Arduino libraries that I've found that allow you to read and receive data from one of these things, and that's what I've been using uh, for this guy. This guy's actually the receiver out of my Melty Brain combat robot, and that is what I would suggest you do. So I'll leave a link in the description, or I'll at least leave the name of the Arduino library that I'm using. I actually might throw some basic code. Oh no, the Arduino library has basic read code for this. So I'll leave the, the name of the Arduino code and maybe uh, a GitHub library if I can find one for Flysky SBUS receivers in the description because that's the easiest way to do this. There's no quick video that I can do that will show you how those signals work. It would be a very long video that I would have to go over a couple of times. Uh, so yeah, just use a library for these guys. It makes your life a lot, lot easier. Anyway, I think that's gonna be it for this video. I've just kind of recovered and fixed up some mistakes that I made in the past. I hope you guys have enjoyed that one and I will see you in the next video.